Hi, we're going to talk about neurologic diseases and conditions. These are the common signs and symptoms. So motor function disturbances such as stiff neck or back, inability to move or paralysis, seizures, sensory function disturbances, visual or speaking, disturbances in alertness or cognition, so drowsiness uh, or possibly a coma, and forgetfulness. We have the afferent versus efferent nerves. So the afferent are the sensory nerves. Okay? And the efferent neurons are the motor neurons. Okay? So the sensory, of course, is when you send some, sense something, it sends signals to the brain. Motor neurons, the brain sends signals to the muscles. This is just a picture of some neuroglial cells. Glia, those are stromal cells that regulate the chemical environment of neurons. And the neuroglial cells are brain glial cells. The human brain has a ratio of neuroglia to neurons of 10 to 1. Okay, now let's just talk a little bit about each one of these. So the oligodendrites, this forms the myelin sheath that protects the axons in this uh, central nervous system. Okay. The microglial cells, these are phagocytes. They protect the neuron in response to inflammation. The astrocyte, okay, these are um, star-like. They transport water and salts between capillaries and neurons. These ependymal cells, these line the membranes within the brain and around the spinal column. Now, we have what's called a blood-brain barrier. This is a protective feature of astrocytes. It regulates the entry of potentially harmful agents from the blood to the nerve cells. We're going to talk about uh, vascular disorders, cerebrovascular accidents, and a transient ischemic attack. Cerebrovascular accident. Blood supply to the brain is interrupted. You get brain damage due to ischemia or hemorrhage. Ischemia could be a thrombotic stroke. It's a stationary clot that forms in a blood vessel or an embolic stroke. An embolus is a clot that travels through the bloodstream and becomes lodged in a vessel. Now, a cere cerebral hemorrhage is when you have bleeding directly into the brain tissue and can be caused by a cerebral aneurysm. It lasts greater than 24 hours, um, and the signs and symptoms, they all appear suddenly. A severe headache, aphasia, that means they can't communicate, weakness, hemiparesis, confusion, and vision problems. Okay. Now, um, this is just from the American Stroke Association um, to how to spot a stroke, think of fast, face drooping, arm weakness. So, you know, you try to get them to reach their arms above the head. They can't, they can't speak. Um, and then time to call 911. A transient ischemic attack is a warning stroke or a mini stroke produces stroke-like symptoms but no lasting damage. It's caused when a blood clot temporarily clogs an artery and part of the brain doesn't get the blood it needs. The short duration of these symptoms and lack of permanent brain injury is the main difference between a transient ischemic attack and a stroke. So a TIA is less than 24 hours and a CVA is greater than 24 hours. And the head trauma, epidural and subdural hematoma, cerebral contusion, cerebral concussion, and skull fractures. Now, these are the meninges, okay? They, they um, you have the, in the brain, okay? And then you have the pia mater, the uh, arachnoid mater, 
Okay, and then that subarachnoid space right in here, that's where the spinal fluid is. And the dura mater is, um, is much harder. It's much firmer. Okay, and then that's the skull. So those are the three layers surrounding the brain. The cerebral hematomas. You have an epidural hematoma, uh, mass of blood that occurs between the skull and the dura mater. Usually the rupture of a meningeal artery following a skull fracture and a subdural. So an epidural is above the dura mater. Subdural is below, right? Results from tearing of veins between the dura and arachnoid membranes and usually from a blunt trauma. Cerebral concussion. It's from the Latin concutere, which means to shake violently. This is a mild traumatic brain injury. It's caused by a back and forth movement of the head or a blunt force trauma. It's associated with a transient loss of brain function. It occurs when a violent blow to the head causes the brain to slam against the skull beyond the ability of the cerebral spinal fluid to cushion the impact. If the frontal lobe is affected, the patient may exhibit bizarre, irrational behavior, um, thinking, deciding, remembering, or their personality may change. If the temporal lobe of the brain is affected, the patient may become temporarily disoriented or have temporary amnesia. Um, in the auditory area or the memory. Now, in a cerebral concussion, you this is widespread and it's microscopic. It can't be seen on a CT or an MRI. A cerebral contusion, on the other hand, is localized and it's macroscopic and it can be seen with a CT or MRI. Okay, that's for me the difference, one of the main differences between the two. Now in a contusion, this is a bruise on the brain tissue, it's more serious than a concussion and it's caused by a blow to the head or impacting a hard surface such as occurs in an auto accident. Um, you have the coup contra coup. A coup is where the head was directly impacted. Okay, you see the Oh, I'm sorry, I need to move this. So the coup is the blow. That's where it was originally impacted. The contra coup back here is the area where the brain bounced against the skull. When the brain bounces against the skull, there is a twisting and or tearing of blood vessels and other brain matter. The contra coup injuries usually result in edema. If the bleeding is extensive, the contusion will lead to a hematoma, which is a collection of blood. This is a depressed skull fracture. It's right here. A portion of the skull is pushed in on the brain. Some um, other types of skull fractures. There's a comminuted skull fracture right here where a portion of the skull is splintered or crushed into pieces. And then we have a linear skull fracture. There's a break in the bone, but the bone isn't moved. A diastatic skull fracture. These are fractures that occur along the suture lines in the skull, so right here. And a basilar skull fracture. They have these preorbital edema and ecchymosis. Ecchymosis is bruising, and they have like raccoon eyes. Okay. Um, this otorrhea and this bruising back here. Okay, and this is post auricular or behind the ear ecchymosis. This is called battle sign. Okay, there's a break in the bone at the base of the skull, and this is the most serious fracture. Okay, paraplegia and quadriplegia. So, hemiplegia is a loss of voluntary muscle control and sensation on one side of the body. Paraplegia, there's a paralysis of the trunk and lower extremities. And in quadriplegia, the location of the spinal cord injury and the type and severity of the trauma on the spinal cord determine if the patient is paraplegic or quadriplegic. And the quadriplegia is paralysis of all four extremities and usually the trunk.
When the neurons that control the muscles become diseased or injured, a person loses the ability to move muscles voluntarily. Intervertebral disc disorders, um, degenerative disc disease, herniated and bulging disc, bulging disc, sciatic nerve injury, or spinal stenosis. Degenerative disc disease. This is a degeneration or deterioration of an intervertebral disc. Um, causes of this are aging because water in the disc decreases or misalignment of the vertebrae. Herniated disc is also called a slipped or ruptured disc. The most common sites are between L4 and L5 or between L5 and S1. It's usually caused by a spinal trauma from a fall, straining, or lifting a heavy object. It may be related to degenerative disc disease. Um, it occurs when the nucleus propulsus leaks through the wall of the disc into the, and into the spinal canal where it may press on spinal nerves and cause pain and disability. Okay. The intervertebral disc is a sac-like mass of cartilage. One is found between each of the 33 vertebrae. Within each intervertebral disc is the nucleus propulsus. Okay, that's this guy's right here. It, this is a soft gelatinous mass that helps each disc cushion the movement of the vertebrae. So some signs and symptoms are paresthesia, which is a sensation of numbness, prickling, or tickling. Sciatic nerve injury or spinal stenosis, it's a narrowing of the spinal canal or nerve root foramen. Causes of compression, causes compression of the spinal cord and spinal nerve roots. Uh, and these are the functional orders that we're going to talk about. Um, headache, migraine, epilepsy, seizure disorder, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's, Correa, 